All right, and welcome back to another edition of Testimony Tuesday. This is Pastor Adam from Virginia Beach, and I am very pleased to welcome uh, another guest to this Testimony Tuesday. I'm uh, continually amazed uh, at how far-reaching these episodes go, and uh, so it's a great pleasure for me to welcome uh, evangelist Pastor Jeremiah Wacker. Welcome to the show, sir. Hey, man. Thank you for having me on. Appreciate the invite. Yes, well, we appreciate you uh, uh, taking some of your downtime in between revivals and uh, spending some time with us. And uh, yeah. so we, uh, we're, we're very appreciative to uh, have a fellowship full of amazing people who have experience all around the world. And uh, so I'm excited to hear your story today. Yeah, awesome. And, uh, you know, ever since you were overseas and you had uh, this mysterious thing that back in the early 2000s, called a blog that we were <laughs> able to kind of breaking ground there. And uh, so I kind of have always, always heard about you and then I uh, have caught, uh, I love the pastor Mitchell sermons on the podcast. So uh, what you do, man, is a great resource and it's super cool to be a part of it, man. Well, thank you. We yeah. appreciate that. And we're doing it all to try to be a blessing to some pastors, disciples, church members all around the world. And, it only continues to grow, so we're, we're blown away by what God is doing. So awesome. for those who don't know you, uh, Pastor Wacker, uh, where are you from? What is your history in the fellowship? And uh, give us the short version before we deep, do a deep dive. Yeah, very cool. So um, I was saved when I was 16 years old. I was way back in 1993. I was saved in an Assembly of God Church in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And um, so I was saved for about nine months. I had only been filled with the Holy Spirit about one month. And um, my youth pastor in that church is cousins with Artie Aragon. And oh, so wow. we had done, yeah, we did a, a little trip. Uh, we had a big trip. There was about 55 youth that went from Colorado down to the res um, for a summer missions trip, what they would call, you know, and uh, I was a part of the reconnaissance team. So a um, long story short, I got some one-on-one -on -one time Memorial Day weekend of 94 with Artie uh, just being around his church. And, um, you know, uh, whether it's the good, bad, or the ugly, I didn't leave his side for about 72 hours, man. I was uh, hooked, you know, just following him around. Uh, my sister ended up getting saved in Colorado. Uh, we ended up, you know, having that missions trip in the summer and God dealt with us. We're originally from Colorado. That's where I was with my grandparents. Uh, but my family, my parents were back in Austin, Texas. God dealt with me and my sister. We moved back to Austin and um, ended up finding a, a church. I called Artie. I said, hey, man, I want a church like yours. And uh, ended up at the door in Austin, Texas. Uh, Barry Parker uh, was four years in the pioneering that work. And so my sister and I became a part of the, the core there. There's about 10 or 12 folks there when we went and we've uh, been able to watch it explode. Um, and just all that God's done through the, the Austin, Texas church. So uh, I've been locked in. That's been home base since 94. Um, I got married in 99, had a Jesus people wedding, which is a miracle for both me and my wife, considering where we came from. And um, uh, ended up getting announced in the year 2000, pioneered a church in South Austin, was an assistant uh, for one year for Pastor Parker in the Austin church, which we saw a really awesome season of growth during that time, one of the most precious uh, seasons of my ministry. And then we went to California and uh, pioneered over there. And uh, some people would say that's a missionary work, but uh, yeah. the, the verdict's still out on that, you know. Um, Sodom and Gomorrah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Californication. So uh, <laughs> we we navigated through what, that. Which city? It was uh, Madera, Madera, California, right outside of Fresno. And um, some of the precious souls that were saved there, awesome pillars in the Fresno church now. And we're super proud of them. And they're, they're a great uh, testimony and then to just all that, that God's done. So that ended in a redirection, which was a really, I don't talk about it a whole lot, um, but uh, somebody accused me of having done everything there is in the ministry for the fellowship. 
So when I started to think about it, you know, we pioneered, we were door directors, we pioneered. Um, I was an assistant. Uh, we've even gone through redirection, but uh, it didn't change our theology. Uh, the only thing I really say about that season, man, is that I always was at prayer, always dressed up, always ready to do whatever God wanted us to do, uh, even during that time. So we didn't lower our theology, our expectation because of our failure, because of uh, failed expectations through a lot of hard work. We, we worked our butts off there and just didn't see what we wanted to. So anyways, um, that um, turned into positioning us to be able to take over church and college station, Texas. Um, we were there for a few years, then came, uh, just helped out in the mother church for a short period of time, preaching around, and then was announced to be a full-time evangelist in oh, wow. somewhere around 2013, 2014, and uh, spent almost five years uh, traveling around, was uh, super privileged to be able to hit 17 countries, and uh, I think we've uh, cap done over 200 revivals, so just you know we 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 whatever we do we do hard man so uh <laughs> we worked real hard there god had called me to india and uh, that was a transitionary period where i let my pastor know about it it didn't happen when i would have preferred as far as my time frame but god had everything set up perfectly and ended up going in 2018 uh to india uh two and a half almost three years and now we're back full-time evangelism wow and uh, back on the trail. And uh, so that's kind of the, uh, the long short. Man, what a, what a ride, huh? Yeah, yeah <laughs> definitely. Well, I'm, I'm super I've, grateful, super, super amen humble by what God's done through me and my family. Praise God. Well, I've already got a bunch of questions that I want to ask you. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, but let's, uh, let's start at the common place, which is at the beginning and, uh, tell us about your background and how you grew up. What was your family life like? Yeah, very good. So I, I was, uh, you know, in one sense, I was very blessed. I had both my parents. Um, they were very good people in many, many aspects. Uh, they loved us, you know, my, my family tremendously. I have an older sister, a younger sister. And, um, but you know, my, my parents, they were backsliders. They were, um, uh, my mom was converted as a very young teenager. When her parents got saved, my mom was born in Paris. My grandparents immigrated over here. My grandfather joined the American air force. Oh, and, wow. uh, yeah, he's just, he, he's one of my heroes, man, this guy, uh, my grandfather, but he was 40 years old walked out of a Catholic church in Colorado Springs, Colorado. He was already a lieutenant colonel, very well off, very established, very educated, uh, very stable life. But he walked out of a Sunday mass and he looked at my grandmother and at the age of 40 years old, he said, there is more to God that we don't have. Mm. Put him on a journey. They ended up at a, a first assembly of God in Colorado Springs, lifted their hand, answered an altar call, got born again, got filled with the Holy Spirit, and were converted, wow. man. So powerful. That's amazing. My, my mom was, I think, around 12, 14 years old. They all three of them got baptized together, and powerful testimony. Um, my, grand, my, my, my dad, he was kind of a church kid, raised also. Uh, my parents met at church. Um, you know, they answered altar calls to be uh, missionaries is, is actually what they had done. I got Wow. testimony from that but uh, they fell into sin and um you know uh, don't get me preaching because i you know I, I end up preaching about all this but it's just heartbreaking because they fell into sin but they didn't respond properly and their comment was well let's just go see what the world has we'll come back later well they never came back you know they never went back to church by the time i came around they were deep 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 into the uh, new age religion I was raised in wow. a cult by the name of unity. And, um, you know, I was taught there is no devil. There is no sin. Uh, Jesus was just a guru, a good person. Uh, don't trust the Bible. You know, so I was, uh, we, we are all God, you know, and uh, we would, our youth group, we would meditate with candles. And uh, I'm aware of people who had levitated, people who had soul travel. I mean, they were getting deep into all of that. Um, I think because of my grandparents' prayer, 
uh, I never got deep into that because I gave myself to it. I was only a teenager, 14, 15, and 16, and, and, and I was embraced the theology. I, I was into the philosophy. So, uh, you know, with all the talk of peace, love, and, uh, you know, world, world harmony, uh, there was no harmony in my house. So, wow. you know, it's just a lot of chaos, man. My, um, you know, I don't mean any disrespect whenever I share the testimony with my family, but I mean, not once did I ever, was I ever aware of my family paying rent on time or my, my, my dad holding down a job or, you know, it, it just a lot of stuff. So that uh, precipitated me, what I consider kind of running away, you know, and left from Texas to go to Austin, uh, from Austin, Texas to Colorado. Uh, first year I was with my grandparents, that was my ninth grade year, gave them so much wow. trouble, so much trouble, man. But uh, they were trying to get me into church. Part of my journey was that I literally became integrated in a couple of youth groups for a short period of time, but there was never any difference. I didn't have to change. The kids weren't different. Uh, the preaching, I, I don't remember anything. I never got convicted or dealt with, but I remember walking in on September 1993 to the church I got saved in and something was different. It, it put me so on edge that as the youth pastor was preaching the gospel, I was like, this is totally opposite of what I believe. I literally got up and walked out in the middle of the service, waited in the parking lot for my grandparents. Um, so that, that's what, how was, opinionated. Was the, uh, that a, a opinionation? Did that come from the, the, the history in the cult that you had grew up in? Like, or did you receive a lot of that? Maybe even subconsciously, you think? Yeah, subconsciously and consciously. I literally had arguments in my mind when he was talking about Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. That was opposite of my worldview. I was taught that all religions are different ways to the same place. And mm -hmm. um, later on, I found out that that's not biblically true as far as heaven. It is biblically true as far as judgment day. Sure. We're all on different paths to the same place, but it ain't uh, utopia. You know, it, it's, That's right. it's judgment. It's the judgment. So, no, I mean, I, I had a worldview. I had a set of philosophies that that was contrary to what the Bible was teaching. So I think this is actually uh, unique to our podcast so far, which is uh, we've we've had people from Catholic backgrounds and atheist backgrounds and uh religious backgrounds, but uh, never somebody who was in a bona fide cult. So congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know how to say I, thank you. or oh, Lord, <laughs> I, I just uh, I, I'm curious about it. And, uh, you know, maybe you could tell us a, a little bit more about what kind of things that that uh, that that put into you and maybe some of the struggles that well, obviously you you rejected the gospel outright at the beginning. But, um, you know, what, what effect did that have on you go, as you were growing up? Yeah, you know, I, and, and when I don't want to philosophize, but I'm just going to throw it out there just as part of something that I've thought about throughout the years. But I was at different churches, you know, uh, as a younger teen, and I didn't feel anything different, you know. So they were talking about the Bible and about Jesus. And I don't know, like I said, it, it, that could it be a long philosophical question, like, was I just not ready or, but in a way, it's almost like without the presence of the Holy Spirit or without the conviction, it's like everybody's just the same. You just integrate. And sometimes what I say is that we are not here to teach sinners how to be religious and without being overly judgmental, because there are a lot of factors that I don't remember, but it's almost like that's the arena that that's what I experienced. Now, before, when I was a kid, I was in a Holy Ghost atmosphere three or four times and I responded and I was prophesied over when I was about six years old that I was oh, wow. the pastor is about 3000 people in the church service. It was a Holy Ghost church in Denver, Colorado. He left the pulpit, walked over, laid hands on me, said that I was called to to do a work for God. So I have very, do you very remember memories. that. Very little, very little. I remember yeah. the, the pastor. I remember what he looked like. I remember the crowds. I don't remember feeling anything or I don't remember his words, but it's kind of like my slight memory. And then my aunt who had always told me about it. So, uh, but that gets me back to where you asked about like how my philosophies 
were sideways with the gospel. And I think part of it might have been it was my time. And part of it was there was an anointing. There was mm-hmm. an anointing on the preaching. It was clear. Uh, it mentioned sin. It mentioned salvation. And I don't remember the exact messages, but I remember it dealt with me. And uh, again, you know, it, it's powerful with our testimonies because it's what God did for us. And so this is not a theology, but, you know, true salvation must include repentance and faith. That's right. My, yep. my, my introduction into the kingdom was with a simple faith. It was a simple faith that I want Jesus. I, I had an argument to the fact that I did not have sin and there was no devil, but I know that I knew that I had sin and I knew that there was a dark force because I was struggling with insomnia uh, the mm. whole summer between ninth and 10th grade. I could not sleep before 3 a.m. staring at the ceiling, thinking about infinity. Uh, you know, I didn't know the scripture eternity is in their hearts, but I just thought of outer space and like for an hour, my mind would go as far <laughs> as it. And I'm just like tormented, like, dude, what? what's out there. And um, so I just lifted my hand that second time I went to church, I went from walking out in the middle of the service to lifting my hand and answering an altar call in the second service. The first six months were, yeah. What, what, what happened between the first and the second, like the first one you're walking out, you're like uh, your history is causing you to just reject it. But then the second one, you're like jumping in with both feet. What's up with that? Absolutely full-on supernatural (laughs) seriously there was no argument there was no no thing i spent the next four months arguing with the pastor (laughs) like i literally um now the youth pastor he was he was brilliant and he was anointed it was very powerful and it was very directly hitting right where i lived as a sinner 16 year old in the main sanctuary Um, you know, the religious world kind of separates them and stuff like that. But Sunday mornings, this family would give me a church, uh, give me a ride. I would listen to it. I enjoyed the worship. I I had faith. That's why I really don't know the day I got saved. I claimed my salvation September of 94, because that's when I answered altar call. That's when I got baptized, water baptized. But I would, I would go literally every Sunday morning. And when this family were driving me home, My two buddies would be in the back seat. Their mom and dad would be in the front seat. And I would argue. I mean, I was literally raising such a hippie new age philosophy that I had no respect for authority, unfortunately. So I would like literally raise my voice and I was uh, very disrespectful, but I would say, no, the pastor said this abortion, sexual immorality, you know, and I would argue and the, the, one of the phrases, and, and there's not a one answer like that moment I got saved, but this is the actual answer of what changed my life, is that this, this man, the father, he never scolded me, he never belittled me, every time he would listen, oh, okay, oh, Wacker, okay, yeah, I get it, Wacker, that's cool, he said, you know, that makes sense, I see where you're coming from, Wacker, but the Bible says, uh, and then he would give this calm, collective, authority. It was dominion. And, and I, I don't remember a single thing he said. I just know that it was supernatural. I was doing something wow. later on and I'll fast forward. We can come back. But when I got launched out in 2000, I found that, that, that guy's number because uh, in that gap, I moved to Austin, but I found him in Colorado, called him. I said, bro, I just want to let you and your family know, man, I appreciate y'all. Uh, I'm so sorry the way that I acted towards you and your dad. And I said, I want y'all to know that I've become a pastor. And he put his phone down. He said, mama, mama, Wacker's a pastor. She said, I don't believe it. I don't, not even, that's impossible, you know, but so anyways, that was a major key. Um, I backslid really hard when I left Colorado, went to Texas. Uh, This is a whole nother segment of my story, but my dad was not saved. He was a backslider. And I had no idea that he was diametrically opposed to my salvation over the phone from Colorado to Texas. He's like, oh, that's cool. Then he would try to subtly dismantle everything that God was teaching me and building in me. When I went with him, he picked me up from the Greyhound 
bus station in Austin, Texas, first thing he did was give me a joint. That two weeks was just a lot of nonsense. I end up back in Colorado and same church, same chair, same Bible, same friend, same preacher. And I'm looking at all them and they say, I said, something's different about these people. I didn't feel any hunger, any desire. That sin had completely put out you know, that fire that mm. was building in me. And how um, long after, after your salvation experience was that? So that was four months, September, wow. then December. And, uh, by God's sovereign grace, I, I just had no, I couldn't find people to sin with. I didn't enjoy the sin. And my uh, life changing moment was, uh, the, the Tuesday, last Tuesday of January, 94, there was a prayer meeting. There's only youth, about 14 kids were getting prayed for to get filled the Holy Ghost. Everybody, man, just busted out in tongues. It was incredible. Everybody got the anointing. Everybody got the baptism except me. And that put me on a journey from the end of January. The day I got filled was March 30th. And the, the, the dynamic of being sanctified, being delivered, getting filled with God, that 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 was a defining season for me march 30th was my uh, no turning back moment 1994 uh, it's been no looking back ever since that day and um so you were yeah. you were still 16 at that point yes yep nine mm -hmm. months saved just got filled the holy ghost uh only one month after that i end up in chin lee i meet Artie, and yeah. uh Three months after that, God speaks to me and my my sister very clearly. My sister got saved right around that time as well. She actually got baptized with the Holy Ghost in Chinle, Arizona. So that's wow. kind of part of her so story. Did she did she come to uh, your grandparents' house also? Yeah. So she had spent uh, a year with my aunt in Denver. She had to get away from the chaos. She ended up coming to be in Colorado Springs with me and my uh, grandparents. And older or younger she, sister. She's younger. And one of the pre most precious things I have in my entire life is her testimony that says, when I saw how God changed my brother, I wanted what he had. Mm. And uh, she, she immediately got saved. When I told her what happened, immediately she got saved. She's still serving God today. She's married, three beautiful daughters. She's the sign language interpreter in our church here in Austin. Oh, wow. Her brother-in-law awesome. is in our song service and a pillar in our church. So, yeah. So one question I like to ask is about your yeah. new convert experience. Those first couple of years uh, in the kingdom can be a time of great miracles. Do you remember any remarkable things that God did during that time? Yeah. So just my conversion uh, story, those first nine months, that to me is a miracle. The other miracle is the sovereignty of God's timing. So that is that I was barely saved nine months, not even a month filled with the Holy Ghost. And I was chosen as a leader to go on this four day reconnaissance trip. The pastor, two other young men and myself to go to Chinle, Arizona. That, that was a miracle. I had no business being called a leader or no business being on that trip. But it allowed me, you know, everybody in our church got to meet Artie Aragon in July, but that was a very busy eight days. Uh, no alone time with him. It was straight work. It was incredible. But that one on one time I had with him, uh, I joke and say it ruined my life. I ne I'll never will be able to lead a normal life after being around a man <laughs> like that. His compassion, his anointing, his love for people, love for the word of God. And uh, just, uh, you know, meeting somebody like that. So, so that was a miracle, you know, that God put me in a position uh, to, to meet him. The, the next thing that happened was on that trip because the youth pastor and the two other dudes, they would go rest at the hotel. But I'd be like, nah, if Artie Aragon's awake, I'm going to be next to him. And I went with him to visit a lady. We prayed for her, saw her leg grow out. It was my first miracle seeing wow. that. And Artie told me, he said, well, there's a guy that I, that I really love a lot. His name is Wayman Mitchell. And Wayman Mitchell has seen all kinds of miracles. And Pastor Mitchell told me that what he does, I can do. And so he said, Jeremiah, what I've done, you can do. I was like, whoa. 
So I prayed for a girl in our youth group. She's 13 years old. She's lactose intolerance. This is my first miracle. I prayed for her. And this little um, city girl, she's a church kid, but she loved God, man. And when I prayed for her, she said, I felt something touch me. And she went to the restaurant, got a large glass of milk, and she chugged it like a dude. Chugged it like an like a MMA athlete after a fight. And she said, no problem. Next morning, she's slamming milk with her pancakes, and she got healed. Um, wow. So th- th- that was like, I saw it. He said, you can do this. Gave me two scriptures, Mark 16, Numbers uh, 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie. He's not the son of man that he'll go back on his promise. What he said, he'll do it. What he promised, he will perform it. And why can he promise that you could lay hands on the sick? And so I was like, dang. In that trip, there was a young man. And I'll stop here and then see if this is, you know, because there are so many other ones. But uh, on that trip, there was a dude named Adrian. He was 19 years old. He was part of our youth group in Colorado. He had gone to the U.S. military, took the ASVAT, passed the flying colors, passed the physical, went to the doctor, and he had uh, was ready to join the army. But what happened was when he was 12 years old, he had an accident and he broke some kind of growth thing in his shoulder. So when mm. he's six, he's six one. Oh, did I lose you? What happened? Uh, Sorry. Gotcha. So when he would put his hands together like this, it was a whole hand length. He's six one. So this is like, we're talking maybe four to six inches. And Artie told us, you pray with your eyes open. He said, I don't want to see none of you city kids praying with your eyes closed. You're going to watch this. And we prayed for Adrian, dude. And we watched his arm grow out. It was so significant that he went back from that trip, reapplied for the military and was accepted. The doctor saying, we don't, we've never heard of this condition that we had in your other file being corrected. We want to meet a wow. plastic surgeon, but um, that's how significant. So that was a huge reference point. Oh my goodness. So I'm trying to get my head around how you ended up in Chinle, Arizona with, uh, with, with the pastor there. And so the assembly of God church was like doing some kind of a mission strip on the res. Is that what it was? Yeah. Yeah. Because my youth pastor in the assembly church was Artie's cousin. Oh, right. You mentioned that. So, okay. So he knew what was going on out there and he was like looking at all these city kids thinking they need to get out of their little bubble. Let's take them to the res and see what God is doing out there, man. That that's amazing. That's so good. (laughs) Like out of the box thinking Uh, that's, that's almost like, I mean, it's, it's not the same, but it's almost like an overseas trip, right? This is like, this is the reason why we go on impact teams around the world. It's the same idea. Yeah. So that's yeah. pretty awesome, man. Had, had you yeah. had you ever been in that kind of an environment before? No, absolutely not. So, uh, yeah, the, the dynamics of the res and the kind of the third world vibe, I'd never been around that. And then even saved great people. The church I got saved in was a wonderful church, awesome people. But to see a man that is broken, set apart for God, and walking with a tangible anointing, that to me is one of the most valuable dynamics that a human being, you know, I don't want to just be a good Christian, man. I don't want to be a good preacher. I don't want to be a good dad. I, I don't, I, I don't want that. I want something tangible that's from another world. I want something spiritual, a dynamic, you know, and that, that was put in my DNA right in the very beginning. Wow. So I bet you wanted to stay. <laughs> yeah, actually, you know, it's, I, I, I would have, you know, but that's the other miracles that God guided me. You know, I would have gone to Chin Lee in a heartbeat, but I was 16 turned 17. My sister was 14 years old. So, you know, I've asked God before, like, Hey, why didn't I end up in Chin Lee? You know, that's not what God wanted. I ended up in Austin and uh, pastor Barry Parker became kind of like a father to me. So, you know, the story progresses and the yeah, short so, version. So how, yeah. how'd you end up in Austin? How, how'd you get to the Potter's house there? So uh, it was a simple call to Artie. Say, I want a church okay. like yours. Gave me Pastor Barry Parker's phone number. And um, my sister and I went there. 
there's a longer version of that. And you're asking about new convert miracles. One of the new convert miracles was the day God spoke to me to leave Colorado to go to Austin. The other miracle is my sister and I were for two months. Uh, tell me if uh, this is going too long. All right. But because it's it just gets me kind of fired up. But we, we were two months Sunday morning at Assembly of God Sunday night at the door, the Potter's house, you know, in Austin. Okay. Yep. And we were fasting. We, we totally understood we needed to find a home church. We knew that, you know, no problem. And Pastor Parker released us. The assembly pastors like, yeah, dude, whatever, you know. And God spoke to me and my sister about 12 hours apart and spoke the exact same words into our spirit. You know, I want you at the door. There's a longer version of how that went down, but we we just said, dang, okay. And that confirmation was on us. We said thank you to the Assembly Church. They blessed us, sent us on, you know, our way, and we joined the Austin Church. Um, and that, that's where we were locked in. It was a trip because we're talking 10 or 12 people with a working pastor. And yeah. um uh, that's from a church of a thousand people with a hundred kids in the youth group with all kinds of activities and all kinds of stuff right. going on to being like, uh, it, it was a really, really hard two years for me and my sister. Um, but we were determined to be a part of the growth of that church. Uh, we were not satisfied with just normal church. We wanted a revival. We contended for revival. We did anything and everything we could to support Pastor Parker and to be a part of that. Those 10 or 12 people that were serving God in the Austin Church in 94 are still serving God today and a, and a part of this congregation. So the church has launched out over 20 churches. Um, there are 10 of them that are that are strong and that are still there now. Uh, First Grandbaby Church will be going out here probably in a few months uh, from the College Station Church that I had a privilege to pastor for a little while, but oh uh, man, that's awesome. Yeah. So, uh, but that was a challenge in the beginning because there was no youth. There was, you know, these people were good, hardworking, faithful people, but they just weren't doing stuff. They weren't partying. I mean, not party, fellowshipping every night. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Um, they were faithful to the Saturday outreaches, but doing stuff on a Thursday night or Sunday night after church was, you know, they they, they were good and faithful but we were just, we were stretched, you know? So we made some yeah. great friends in Pastor Richard Ruby's church, which is our mother church. And, um, and those friendships last till today. But um, anyways, yeah. So that was that transition period there. So, so that's great experience because as you're preaching around as an evangelist, I mean, you get to see churches that run the gamut, right? From, from the 10 to 12 people. Uh, all the way to some of the larger churches in our fellowship. So um, does that does that help you uh, to encourage people? I'm sure it does. 110% because yeah. not only were we there, but Pastor Parker was at his four-year mark when we got there, and there was 12 people after four years of him pouring his life out there. Uh, and truth be told, there had been three other pastors in the 80s that had yeah. tried to, they called Austin a pastor killer. So he was technically the fourth pastor, but um, but it didn't happen automatically. So from 94 to 90, uh, December of 96 was the grind, but it was the grind. And in, in 90, uh, January 1st, 1997, our church was about 30, 35 people. And in the next six months, we watched that church go from 30 uh, to 35 people to run in over 80 people. Wow. And by 98, we were breaking 100. So not so what, only... What do you, what do yeah. you think contributed to that breakout? Well, very good. That's a powerful question. Part of it was um, Pastor Parker. He, I don't know if this is a real word, but he calls it stick to And he was just, he was persevering. That's righteous uh, he, stubbornness. That's exactly, that. that, <laughs> that is the definition of pastor barry parker right there and so his his uh tenacity and uh, his fire he never lost the fire and um and then just how god used me and my sister i don't personally technically talk about it too much um but it was the faithful people 
And it was how God was building the church. I like to preach on Acts chapter 16. And I um, hate to give away one of my special messages, but Acts chapter 16, you have Paul, Timothy, Luke, Silas. You have Lydia. You have the jailer. You have the demon-possessed girl who obviously got saved and probably locked into the church. And so what a diverse group of people from Jews to Roman jailers to a demon possessed servant girl. So that, that was part of it is that pastor Parker stayed faithful. We all stayed behind him and everybody had such a different role. And my role, my sister's role was one out. We just, I, I was a 19 year old kid who went and bought a minivan. I mean, sometimes I'm embarrassed to admit that. Like, what am I doing in a, it's a soccer mom vehicle, you know, but our record was 19 people in that van. <laughs> Just giving sounds, people rides to church, you know, sounds like, sounds like the Mexican minivan. <laughs> that, that's it. That's it. it. It was all of the above. So, uh, you know, that was it. And then there was key conversions. So as God built that core and, uh, you know, the first six months of 97, there were some powerful radical conversions. One of them came from a carnival that we were just driving by. We said, let's go give out some flyers. We didn't know that we were standing in between two groups of people who were about to have a shootout. And wow. as we were preaching, girls preached to some of them. We preached to some of them. They ended up not doing their dirt. And one of those guys got saved and out of his life here i don't know how many years it's been 20 years later uh there's over there were probably over 200 people throughout the course of the year who were of uh, years that were saved converted and uh, we have pastors pastors wives people that because of that one conversion so it was a key convert that was part of it people's faithfulness pastor parker's vision and i think there are just a handful of us that just never settled we, we never settled. We said, we're not going to be comfortable. We're not going to let this, you know, settle. You know, when I was an assistant, yeah. one time we, we, we got to see about 250 people in the services. And one time I said, man, our next level is 300 people. Like I'm thinking, you know, yeah. radical revival. And one of the girls looked at me and says, oh, what do we get a trophy? So it's like some people are comfortable. No, no hating on her. She's faithful. God bless her. But no, I don't want a trophy. I do want to see all that God has for us, you know, that, that driving thing. So mm -hmm. praise God. Well, that's awesome, man. That It's a great story. And what I love about that story of the carnival is that this was not an event that was planned on the church calendar. No. It was just you guys having a heart, seeing people. And uh, man, if we're going to we're going to see revival, we got to have that. We got to have people that have that fire. I'm not going to wait for the Saturday outreach, uh, but have a, you know, have a desire to actually do something and see God move. Uh, I'm yeah. reminded of the, the the story of Pastor Warner's first adventure out in Kearney, Arizona, and just yeah. saw a parade marching down the street, decided, hey, we can be a part of that, too. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. That, to me, defines so much of the attitude of our fellowship is just taking advantage of the opportunity, like like Paul at Mars Hill, you know, uh, yeah. well, there's, there's a, the, uh, inscription to the unknown God. I know who that is. Let's take advantage of the situation. And, yeah. uh, that's something that I try to, I try to put into our guys and believe God to help us. Amen. Are we good yeah. there? Yeah. So, wow. What a, what an experience to see a church break out in, in revival and to see God save a lot of people. And this is still your home based church. This is in Austin, yeah. right? Yes. And you still have the same pastor for all these years. No. So Pastor uh, Parker, he ended up answering the call to China about 10, ah. 11 years ago. Uh, and so he was there nine months. Uh, he got kicked out of the country and uh, he ended up passing away, actually. So Pastor Parker, oh. um, and that's kind of another long story, but he just had some uh, a surprise health uh, incident uh, where he ended up passing away. His son is our assistant pastor now, Adam uh, Parker. But okay. um, so Pastor Roland Perez, his wife, Liz, they're also from Pastor Richard Ruby's church. Um, and so they came, they took over the church when Pastor Parker went to China. 
and they've been with us. Uh, I think uh, this is year number 11. So oh, praise God, man. Yeah. So they are. That's uh, awesome. Fighting it and doing great. All right. Well, uh, so tell me the story about how you uh, were called into the ministry and pastoral ministry. It sounds like it was a pretty early on in your salvation. that You kind of knew that was the direction God was taking you. But tell, tell us uh, yeah. how that went. Yeah. So uh, it's one of those things that goes back to um, those first nine months where I don't remember actual details. But um, are you still there? OK, yeah, good. Cool. Uh, yeah, I don't remember all the details. I just remember sometime after that first prayer to receive the Holy Spirit where I didn't get filled and I just started asking these questions. I started saying, OK, God, why didn't I get it? And that's, you know, all that happened in those three months. Somewhere along the way, I, I knew I just knew that I was called to be a pastor. Now, in the assembly of God, you, um, you know, you commit to Bible college. So my good friend, Tim, we are just started talking about going to the same Bible college together, preaching all over the world. And it just started to become a part of our, our, our life, you know? So I don't know actually when it happened. I did my first Bible study uh, in those three months, uh, Friday night, youth Bible study. And uh, so, you know, when, when I joined the fellowship, uh, the Bible college thing was not even an issue. When, when Pastor Parker said, well, this is how we do it. And, and I said, uh, did Artie Aragon go to college? He's like, no, this is how we do di discipleship. I was like, oh, wow, that sounds exactly like what I read in the Bible. So I was on yeah. board. Uh, part of the story also in those beginning days in the fellowship was my dad um, was diametrically opposed. And he went from being subtle to being very aggressive, to mm. actually kicking my sister and I out of the house. So we were wow. disowned. We were told, you either stop going to church or you're not my kids anymore. And we were literally disowned by our father in order to uh, continue in the call of God. How old were you when that happened? I was 17. My sister was 15. Wow. Wow. Yeah, oh, that's that's got to be hard to, to uh, go through something like that. Yeah, but uh, I imagine that it really solidified your faith in your decision to follow Jesus. Hundred percent. And the reason that I was triggered to mention that is because my calling was not just to preach, but my calling was to be under a pastor. And my calling was to be a disciple. And so it's not just I knew one day I would do something, you know, or that was going to be my vocation. One of the subtle tricks my dad tried was he said, I'll go to the door with you on Sunday mornings. You come with me. We'll go to the assembly of God. We'll go to the Baptist. We'll go to a Buddhist temple. We'll go to a mosque. So you can see what else is out there. You're, you're kind of narrow minded right now, dude. And, and so I'm like, uh, no, dad, I'm not going to do that. You know, I'm not going to do that. And it just came out of my spirit. Nobody said this to me. I said, dad, I'm going to be a disciple. I'm going to get married and I'm going to get sent out of this church with Barry Parker. And I don't know, it just came out of me. So I knew that I was on a track because I was disowned. Uh, things are so different today. So I'm not making a theology. I'm only telling you my story. But uh, because of the way that I was working my way through high school and, you know, getting married young, I didn't have an opportunity for college. I, I, I had an opportunity because I had family members that were willing to help me get loans and grants and stuff. But I said, I, I'm, I need to pastor. I don't want to be in debt. I don't have a clue how I could be faithful to my ministries, work a job and go to school. And so it was not a difficult decision. I knew that my calling was not just a title, but a trajectory and a calling to the path. And I didn't want it to take forever. I heard that Greg Mitchell got, his wife was 16 when they got married. And you know, that Pastor Ruby was 18 or 19, 20 when he was a pastor. I said, right. dude, that sounds like the Bible, uh, you know, and, and not to, to keep talking about Artie, but he preached a sermon about how old Mary was when she 
you know, carrying yeah. Jesus, how old David was. Samuel was 12 years old when he heard the voice of God. And, and was, uh, the, the disciples were not old men with these full grown beards, you know, uh, 40 year old men. They were young professionals, you know, and and so I embraced that. And I said, I don't want to just fulfill my calling. I want to do it uh, in a proper time frame. So uh, when you say that, it's like I knew I was going to be a pastor even from my religious days or my Assembly of God days. But, you know, the calling to be a disciple and to be full on was another dimension that that, you know, needed to be embraced. And, and God yeah. helped me with that. So you you mentioned uh... Uh, part of your calling, obviously, is uh, is the family life and marriage, and so uh, you know there's there's got to be a Mrs. Wacker along the story somewhere here. Yeah. How how, how did that? Yeah. Uh, how how were you introduced? Yeah, she um, she came to church. Um, she got saved in '97. She was a part of that revival, and she walked in, saw my blue eyes, and said, "Anything I got to do to marry this dude." <laughs> uh i love the uh, humility yeah yeah actually you're gonna have to delete that because that that's a lie <laughs> so i need to repent yeah you know she got saved she was one of the girls in the church and um uh, when we were in india they would always ask us if we had an arranged marriage or if we had what they call a love marriage and i said well i arranged it and she loves it so that was you know but uh, in all honesty, God spoke. It was like maybe even an angel or something. It was something outside of me speaking into my ear and just her name, Geneva. She was saved a couple months. I had already had my eyes on another uh, individual from another church, you know, and I was like thinking about Geneva. I was like, wow. And so I talked to my pastor and he said, well, dude, you better pick one because you can't have both. <laughs> Yeah. And he, and he left me hanging. So I just had to pray. I fasted. I prayed. And I said, okay, well, this is a new convert. So I got to stay hands off. They mock me because everybody thinks they knew that I liked her. But I, I waited, let her get locked in, let her, you know, after seven months, we went on our first date. A year later, we were married. And so, wow. yeah. And you were how old when you got married? Um, so I was. Uh, 21 and she was 20. Yeah. Uh, and by the world standards, that's pretty early, but yeah. uh, like you said, uh, from biblical standards, that's uh, pretty normal and maybe even yeah. a little late. <laughs> so <laughs> right. uh, in any, uh, what, what would you say to the young people of today that might, might hear this, who are very hesitant about long-term commitment like that? Has this been a benefit to you? Yeah, it's been a huge benefit. And, uh, the advice that I would give is that, or the, what I would say is that uh, being faithful to God, having good godly friendships and having a good relationship with your headship, it actually works. It, it really does work. You know, uh, in that movie Fireproof, you have the, um, that, that scene, and I don't know if I'm the only one, but it like, it makes your stomach turn when the girl is thinking about moving into an adulterous uh, relationship, you know, and um, she's thinking about moving into this adulterous relationship and uh, the, the other nurses are egging her on like, yeah, you need to do it. I mean, it, that was so brilliantly portrayed how Satan is pulling on the woundings of your heart, the wrong desires. And then yeah. there are people that if you give them a voice, they'll pull you in the wrong direction. Why do I say that? Because if you really do listen to sound advice and you really do have a relationship with God, you can work it out. And yeah. so, you know, um, if, if you're called to be a pastor, my personal conviction is there's a slow track and there's a fast track. Not that you're presumptuous or that you're ambitious in an ungodly way, but saying I'm going to position myself. Yeah. I've heard like four sermons where pastor... Greg Mitchell is saying that people come to him. I can get a job over here. I can go to school. I can do this. And he's asking the same question. Will that help you and move you forward in your calling or will it delay or prevent your calling? And, right. and with that thought process, when it comes to relationships, besides getting saved, 
the man or the woman you choose for marriage is the next most important decision. Uh, you know, uh, it's just straight up. You could lose your destiny Absolutely. over marrying the wrong person. But everything doesn't have to be perfect. Two godly people who are committed to keeping their heart right with headship, keeping godly friendships in place, and committed to work it out. Uh, you know, the word, the, the, in 23 years of marriage, the D word is forbidden in our home. Yeah. There's only a short period of time where it might have been a part of the conversation, but it was not allowed in the house. And we yeah. got through that. Other than that, it's just a rule that we've never had to enforce because it's not part of our thinking. But, you know, that makes yeah. sense. Praise God. So you, uh, you guys got married 21 years old and you were on you were on the discipleship track in the church there and being one of the mm -hmm. early people in the church, like you probably you were kind of setting an example for other people that were getting saved behind you and younger disciples. And yeah. so I guess <clears throat> what I want to ask you about is in that discipleship journey, there are things in all of us that are not helpful to our calling. Um, usually through process of discipleship and correction and those kinds of things, we, we have to work a few things out. And I'm curious um, if you'd be willing to share with the audience some of those things. And the reason I asked this question is because there's always people who are going to hear this that are probably working on those same things. And yeah. so you can encourage somebody uh, by sharing some of what God was trying to work out in your character. Yeah. And are you talking about like a specific season in life or ministry or you're going back to early marriage or before I got married or? Well, I, I'm really uh, asking about the discipleship journey. It doesn't re really matter when, yeah. but gotcha. the, the, the things that God had to work out in your life so that you can yeah. be the guy that you are now. Yeah, very good. So that's a, that's a great question. And so um, one answer to that is I was in a rap group and one of my reference points is that in three years, yeah, I'll never rap again, by the way. So please don't ask that. Um, Special music on your next revival. Yeah, seriously, that would be horrific. So um, all the credit goes to Arnold for keeping that thing together. But um, one of my reference points is in those three years, all three of us were under discipline at one point or the other. So for the majority of the time, there were three rappers. But there were three seasons where it was the other two dudes and I was sat out, you know, it See, was me and one this dude. Is, was, this is why music groups are such an important part of ministry, bro. I'm telling you, because I had a very similar experience in my yeah. discipleship journey. Yeah. So that, that's a reference point, you know, that we all uh, were working through some of those things, you know, and um, I don't say this with any measure of pride or anything. It was just. It was just a decision. And even when I was in discipline as a single uh, teenager disciple in the church, I had to give up my key. I, you know, I had to sit down. I was in the front row instead of in the ushering and uh, not unlocking the building. I always was at prayer. I always had my tie on. I functioned exactly the same uh, for those six months that I did with or without a title. I don't mm. say that it, it, I just, it's just a decision I made. And I think it's helped me along the way, you know, because it's not about a title. It's about being a contender. And I had character issues as you described it. I had things that my pastor had to speak into me that because I hadn't dealt with it, put me in a compromising position. And when it was getting dealt with, I still wanted to be a contender. I still wanted to be right with God. I was still giving people rides to church. You know what I mean? Um, and so, and I still had to keep my heart right. So, you know, that was it. And then when I got married, um, and that discipleship journey, it was, I would say the biggest thing was immaturity I, that, you know, when I think about my first eight years of marriage, which included a couple years of discipleship in the church, and then four years pioneering, one year assistant, three years in California, that, that pocket of time, the biggest thing that 
you know, one of the names of God is Jehovah Makadesh, the God who sanctifies. And having a pastor, having friends, having responsibility, having accountability with that responsibility, Jehovah Makadesh was pulling out of me a lot of immaturity. For my wife, it was a lot of wounds, unhealed wounds. She had a very traumatic childhood, a horrific life before salvation, very rebellious, very immoral. So she has her own testimony uh, that, you know, that we share in different ways at different times. But so that eight years, the discipleship process uh, was helping her heal and helping me grow up. So, Amen. Yeah. Well, wonderful. We uh, we hear uh, so many testimonies from pastors and I, I don't want to uh, minimize, you know, any part of your uh, amazing journey. We, uh, you know, we we hear stories about first churches experiences, you know, uh, <laughs> those poor people that we preach to, you know, those first couple yeah. of years of ministry. Um, and I, I'd love to hear kind of your your pioneer experience. And uh, uh, I'm not sure the other churches, if you pioneered or took over, maybe, maybe mm-hmm. you can describe just some of the experiences you had during that time. Yeah, so my first church um, was in South Austin, and uh, we really saw uh, the hand of God within 12 months. We had three very strong disciples. We had a good flow of visitors and people coming We had some limitations with the building that we were in. And the lessons that came out of that season was just being so rough with people, you know, uh, trying to make somebody a disciple before you help them become a Christian, Um, you know, laying the, the demands or the passion of a contending disciple as, you know, that leadership mantle that somebody would embrace to pursue of the higher call of God, putting that mantle on just believers and new converts. So that, that was just, you know, in a word, learning how to yep. be a little more gentle, a little bit more patient. Um, as an assistant, that, as I mentioned, was one of my most precious times in ministry. Uh, you know, what God did in that season, that was 2005. And um, I'll never forget that. That was very powerful Uh, because I knew my role and I was able to just really, I was relieved of some of the pastoral pressures that were very difficult for me to embrace the administrative part of it. So, you know, I'm more of a higher level visionary kind of, you know, motivator kind of person. And then all of those things that you're learning as a new pastor, that was the other thing, working a job uh, to my... (laughs) I started the church, my son, my youngest son was one year old. And during that four year period, my wife gave birth to our other two kids. So pioneering little kids working a job, it was crazy. So (laughs) that, that was uh, another good lesson. So, um, but then when we went to California, um, we got our butts kicked, you know, we saw some powerful things that God was doing, um, but we, we really did the ministry and our character there. My wife was still not fully healed up. There were areas of her heart that she didn't let anybody touch, not even God. And in areas of my character, I, and, and what happened was um, if I could recommend a book and I'm just going to throw it out there that would have saved my life. If I read it early on was ordering your private world, Gordon Mm. McDonald. I had no idea of the balance between rest and, you know, thinking time, meditation time. I was 100 miles an hour, 24 hours a day, job, family, church. And I got in this really destructive cycle. I was at work and I couldn't think about anything but the ministry. Made me hate my job. Then I was in the ministry and I was thinking about my family. I was thinking about my job. I'd be spending time with my family and I was thinking about my job and how I can make more money because we're struggling financially. California is double the cost of living as Texas. Yeah. We, my mother church didn't anticipate that. We didn't anticipate that. The whole team was thrown off. You know, it was like we got into battle. We're like, oh, dang, you know. 
So <laughs> I got in a super destructive cycle, you know, uh, where I was never in the moment, was never focused on what was in front of me. And I got really, all of my energy was dissipated. I had zero focus and I was, I was going hundred miles an hour. So if you looked at me, you'd be like, dang, you're a hard worker, man. You're, you're active, you're busy. And, and God helped us. People are still saved today because of that labor. But that was, you know, that was round two of the pioneering life. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. So, and redirection served its purpose. Again, okay. we went back for redirection. I, there was a short period of time. My wife didn't know she'd ever want to be in the ministry again, but that's what unlocked her to get healed. She, she got right. completely set free, powerfully delivered our marriage from that day forward has just exponentially gotten better never taken any steps back since that moment of deliverance and breakthrough and i learned stuff i was humbled i was you know i just uh, but part of it was handling redirection properly you yeah. know i uh, never never missed a church service never spoke ill of my pastor uh, didn't blame anybody for the mistakes that I made, even if there were contributing factors from multiple directions. I said, okay, that's a consideration, but biblically, I don't have any way to blame anybody else. So uh, I said, we're going to, we're going to ride this out. We're going to keep our hearts right. And, um, and we, we stayed contending even at what I would consider our lowest point in life, ministry and marriage. Wow. So that, yeah, that's not, not something that we should take. Oh, hold on a second. So that's not something that we should take for granted, right? Because, you know, there, we have seen people uh, not handle it as well as that. And, you know, I, I can think of people even now that, uh, you know, have not recovered from that. And uh, yeah. so that, that, that's a great thing to see, you know, and so, during your time of redirection, um, obviously God began to kind of deal with you about taking a step back uh, into to ministry. But uh, it was different this time because, it, if I'm correct, you uh, you came back as an evangelist. Is that right? Yeah. So that was back uh, 2009 ish, and uh, we went through that season of recuperating and being refreshed. And I will throw one other thing out there you mentioned that some people don't handle it properly but the other thing is is that we all need to be reminded once in a while that many i would say a majority of organizations if i could use that term or denominations yeah. do not facilitate failure or lack of results in a place you know pastor i've heard pastor mitchell quoted as saying hey you feel called we're going to support you send you out. If it doesn't work out, you come back, come back with a good attitude and we'll see what God has next. I I've been around. I met a lot of people from other churches, denominations. I just bumped in to a dude I haven't seen since youth group in 94. So last week, wow. yeah, I got to see a guy that I got saved with in the assembly church. He's moved on. He's doing his own thing. He's got a great ministry. I respect him. But when we're talking about this thing about redirection, no file, no file for a failure coming and being redirected and then being relaunched. Wow. The failure that was under him, that dude will never, ever be in ministry again under their umbrella. Mm. No platform, no way of recovery. So I say that because I constantly am amazed at the grace that God had and the can I say brilliance that Pastor Mitchell had to say, hey, you're valuable. We care about you. It's not just what you do for the fellowship. We care about you as an individual. So I, yeah. I experienced that. It's first, a precious thing. Hand. It really is. Huh? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so that, talk, that about, talk about this, uh, uh, this calling to, uh, to evangelism and uh, what that has meant to you. And because obviously it's, it's a distinct calling from pastoring. And yes. uh, you, you seem to have uh, done pretty well. Yeah, God's been good to us. So uh, I felt that call back in 2003-ish. Um, I spoke to my pastor, spoke to Pastor Ruby about it. And 
that thing was kept under wraps, that calling, that thing inside of me uh, until 2014. So that- so 10 particular, years. Yeah, literally something I knew was there, something I felt might happen, but I can distinctly think of two or three times where I approached leadership with that and they felt like it wasn't time. Mm. Again, I appreciate that. I receive that. I, that's part of discipleship. Good friends, keeping your heart right, having headship and having a relationship with God. So when God did release me in 2014, we did go to College Station after that time of refreshing in our mother church and God really helped us there. Um, uh, save that story for another day. But uh, then we went back for a time in the mother church where we were just helping doing a new convert Bible study, not really functioning with any title, but positioning ourselves and kind of the Austin church was preparing to take on an evangelist as well. So it was just all the, the timing things were working themselves out. Um, so I entered into it uh, for my calling as an evangelist. I immediately uh, made phone calls to Pastor Alvin Smith, uh, Chris Hart, Roman Gutierrez, uh, Jerry Fussell. I immediately began to speak to these men. Uh, I had relationship with some of them already, uh, invited myself to be a part of the lives of the, some of these other guys. Um, we were kind of at a low financial point. So I actually had to catch a Greyhound from Austin to McAllen to go see a Chris Hart revival for one service. Stayed with a friend of mine over there, but I just, I wanted to see, I wanted to see him function, wanted to see what I could learn. And so I embraced it. I, I felt like it wasn't just a, a role, but I wanted the mantle. I wanted, the, I felt if it was a calling, I wanted to embrace it. And along the way, I uh, wasn't shy to ask questions. I had the wonderful opportunity to preach in Guam two or three times. And uh, that time with Pastor Glenn Cluck was very precious to me, mm. always asking questions. We would sermonize and I would get, you know, as much as I could from him. And so, uh, and I know this is maybe a little taboo or a little out of the box, but my first revival for Pastor Cluck, I was like, I don't know if this is weird, but will you pray for me at the end of the Thursday night revival meeting? And yeah. so I closed the service. I handed him the mic. And he said, Pastor Wacker has asked us if we would pray for him and his endeavor. And uh, he laid hands on me. The church was praying for me. And um, it, it was something that, you know, I felt was an impartation, something I, I wanted, you know. Um, during that time, God was calling me and my family to India. So going to India in 2017, we got announced. My wife, it was a huge challenge. Um, because my oldest son was already in welding school, already turning 18 years old, uh, starting his life as a disciple in the Austin church. So we left with just our two younger kids, um, Joshua wow. and Jordan, and my older son, Jeremiah, he stayed behind. For me, it was a huge thing because, you know, I had a number of meetings that I had to let go of. And sure. so it was, it was, you know, kind of not a big deal looking back, but in the moment it was like everything I had, it was like the right. accumulation of 17 years of blood, sweat and tears of ministry and just laying it all out to go and venture, you know? So uh, we went there. I went there with the intention of being there a long, long time. I didn't have five years in my mind. I said, God, if I spend the rest of my life there, I want to plant churches. I want to make disciples. God had other plans and long story longer. I got home, you know, way earlier than I anticipated. Um, How long were you in India? About two and a half years. Uh, we were there during Corona. So our uh, visas were compromised. Uh, we couldn't leave our house for like 60 days in the very beginning. Uh, the U.S. Embassy was trying to get us to leave. There was a lot of uncertainty, but we navigated that for almost a full 12 months. Um my son ended up getting married and we weren't able to come back for the wedding because of just that whole situation. We decided to stay and stay mm. true to the mission over there. But uh, we got to watch it live stream in the middle of the night in, in India. But um, wow. Yeah. We ended up getting back. My son is married now. Got my first grandchild. 
about two months old. Holy smokes, grandpa. That's right. My, <laughs> my daughter got, got married. Uh, she's, she got married when we got back from India a few months after we got back. So, and now, uh, uh, but when we got back, we had a short time of just checking out to make sure I was healthy. And, you know, my pastor kind of putting his hand on my pulse, seeing if I had a good vibe still, you know, and um, <laughs> then in J uh, July conference of 21, I was made uh, an announcement to go full-time evangelism again. And um, it was, it was miraculous what God did for us, man. Wow. Wow. Well, uh, I, I don't want to take up too much more time, but I'm, I, I, I do have uh, a soft spot in my heart for, for world evangelism and missionary work. And I'm just yeah. curious, what, what did that time mean for you there being outside of the States and, uh, and, you know, as a full-time missionary? Yeah, I got you. So uh, the first thing is we determined to just hit the ground running and determined to, to grind it and just, again, 100%. Uh, just full, full on, you know, fifth gear, full speed. Um, and so God makes himself real in ways that you never dream of when you're in that situation. Yep. You know, my family got closer than ever. Uh, my daughter had a conversion experience. She's always kind of, you know, been committed to Christ, faith in Christ. But she had a conversion experience while we were in India through the preaching of one of the wow. Indian pastors at a revival. Praise had, God. And his words were like God speaking directly to her. Uh, my younger son, who was not saved, was radically converted December 2019 mm. while we were in India. So I had the privilege of baptizing three people when I was in India. One of them was a Hindu convert, and the other two were my kids. So <laughs> it's almost know. like it was just for them, huh? I, uh, you know, God did a lot over there, so I could point to a hundred other things, but if at the end of the day, that's all that it was, um, you know, I don't, I don't know how my mother church would, you know, feel about <laughs> yeah. hundreds of thousands of dollars for my two that's kids. That's an expensive <laughs> outreach. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, uh, but no, um, we, we made a tremendous investment. Uh, one of the things about being a missionary was we made a very deliberate and intentional decision to be a part of what the fellowship was doing there. So we met folks from all different wings of the fellowship. We were under our area leader. We supported and gave ourselves to helping the native pastors, the other missionaries. So that was one of the other dynamics and God really helped us in all of that. So I think the fruit of that will only eternity will, 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 will mm. tell, but the miracles we saw, you know, we went to, I went to pray for one person at a hospital uh, there in Kochi. The city I was in was Kochi. The state was Kerala. In India, we were in the southwest tip. Go to the hospital, pray for one person. Ended up there almost three hours. 14 people got saved. 12 oh my demonstrable miracles of healing and deliverance, demons being cast out. So it's just like, man. I believe that can happen in America, but it, it, didn't, it doesn't happen that often. It's, but just yeah. getting to be in that raw feeling like the book of Acts coming to life. And uh, God really does meet you. And God really does become real in a way for a missionary and their family that that may be unique. Amen to that. that it's a special yeah. grace that's given to that level, you know, so. One more reason that I love our fellowship is our is our constant focus on the needs. And I'm sure your heart was leaping as was mine when Pastor Campbell was uh, laying it on heavy in the Prescott conference, man, calling people to India. So, yeah, you know, our, our prayer is that, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, it's actually funny because the, the pastors that I interview for this show, probably three quarters of them have been missionaries. <laughs> and wow. so, um, the, you know, the people are getting a, a, a heavy diet of, of, that calling and I, I, my prayer personally is god inspire a missionary from these stories out of this podcast because uh yeah. I, that that would be just just the icing on the cake but how god yeah. how god uses these normal people 
like you and me, like there's no, nothing special about me, but the, the fact that I had that opportunity to serve overseas, it has shaped my entire life since then. And my, my, yeah. my view of the, the world. And so uh, I really, really appreciate, you know, you responding to that, to that calling and having a, a place in your heart uh, for, for world evangelism. And, yeah. you know, I'm sure that you take that with, with you in every revival that you preach. And um, yeah. so um, I um, was there. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I show pictures of India everywhere I go. Uh, I've got, um, you know, my quiver full of sermons that God speaks to me about preaching. And one of them is a sermon about world evangelism that I've preached in some obvious settings. And then there have been times when God told me to preach it that I would have never chosen it, but I do carry that, that message with me. And, um, I wrestle with, I think it was Hudson Taylor, one of those cats that said, nobody deserves to hear the gospel twice mm. until everybody has heard it once. Yes. I wrestle with that. I don't, I don't think that's a theological statement, but it, it pierces, it pierces deep. And, um, I, I think we are uniquely positioned as a fellowship to, to get people around the world. So, uh, yeah, hundred percent. I carry it with me Amen. and I'm very passionate, uh, about what God can do through ordinary people who would just say yes. Amen. Well, uh, give our audience as we're closing here, give our audience a couple of things that we can pray for, for you and your family, your, your home church there. Is there anything specific that we can be lifting up for you? Yeah. Awesome. I really appreciate that. So uh, for me and my family would be the uh, probably the standard prayer you would pray for an evangelist is for my travels, my health, my uh, for an anointing. Um, when I leave a church, I don't want them to say it was a good revival. I want people to feel like they've had a, a visitation from God. And that's not me. That, that means that God is doing something. And right. The reason I ask for those prayers is because it's not just me. It's not the church. It's a chemistry. It's a timing. You know, I just was in a church here in Corpus Christi, Texas. They were fasting for 40 days. So that's not me. I stepped into a revival atmosphere. 11 visitors, people saved all week. Two people delivered from demons, which is very rare. You know, uh, it's becoming more common, but I don't take credit for that it's people praying for me it's it's the church it's it's my ministry it's a chemistry so so that prayer just for an anointing for my family's safety back home um if anybody is thinking about the austin church uh we're breaking new ground um we had uh, been to a place where we had seven churches out then we had been to a place where it went down to where we only had two churches out now we have 10 churches out so the Austin church is like this uh, dichotomy. It, it, you know, it's seeing the success and failure, but it's also a microcosm, I think, of our fellowship of like keeping steadfast to the vision. And there were some low times, man. It's like we had 14 redirected men in our congregation at one time, but that hasn't stopped us. So if anybody's thinking about the Austin church, pray for uh, enlargement. Pray for uh, worldwide expression and just for continued growth, you know, um, so conversion. So praise God. I, I, I don't know what else to say on that one. <laughs> okay. Praise God. Well, is there anything else you'd like to leave with our audience as we close out this, uh, this interview? Man, uh, somebody one time tried to call me a hero and uh, that was extremely uncomfortable. And I said, I am not a hero. I'm just a simple man who's trying to do the will of God. And I'm willing to do it with all my heart. And yeah. so that's all I, I would leave, man. Just go all in. Uh, so much going on in the world today. Uh, the time is short. The urgency is upon us. Man, do everything you can to preach as much as you can. And if you're on the slow track, man, let go of every weight, every sin that's entangling you and run the race, man. Run it with well, focus, with diligence, with determination, with urgency. Uh, whatever God calls you to, he'll anoint you for, he'll equip you for. 
why do it half-hearted, man? Let, let's just be all in, radical, full on, man. And uh, that's it, man. <laughs> awesome. Well, I don't know about anybody else, but I feel encouraged. <laughs> so I appreciate uh, you and your ministry, your, your testimony. What a powerful thing God has done. And uh, I'm sure um, we can, uh, uh, if there's somebody out there who uh, would like to book you for a future meeting, man, uh, I would highly encourage you, including our church. We're, we'll look into that amen. as well. So uh, yeah, that'll be holy. Amen, I, praise God. Well, thank you so much for joining us uh, on this Testimony Tuesday, Pastor Wacker. All it's right. been a pleasure. Hey, man, thanks for having me, bro. I really appreciate you, appreciate your ministry and uh, everything God's doing over there in Virginia, man. God bless y'all. Praise God. We're believing God for all he has for us. Awesome. All right. Thank you all for listening, for making it to the end of this episode. And uh, if you were inspired, we encourage you to share this with somebody and let somebody know about, um, about this podcast and these testimonies. They are powerful. Uh, examples of what God can do in a life, in a human life. And I'm just uh, want to encourage you to, to continue to get the word out and tell people about this. Uh, God is doing something much bigger than just, uh, just a little podcast. Uh, he is bringing glory to his name. And that's why we continue to do this as we support world evangelism in the process. So thank you for being a supporter. And we will see you next time on Testimony Tuesday. Thank you very much. God bless you.